All right, well, for kicking off the new year, we're going to take a break from uh, Genesis for three weeks. And we're going to go through a series on Christian growth. Uh, the first week is today. We're going to go over the relationship. Next week, we'll go over the Word of God and the life of the believer. And week three, we'll go over the helper. Uh, these truths that, uh, that we're going to go over are in some ways simple. Uh, in the sense, if you take hold of them, if you hear them, they're simple to understand. If you apply them to your life, they're radical in the transformation that occurs. And, uh, and so I just want to encourage you as you listen to these different things. Some of it's going to be familiar. Maybe some of it's going to be new. Uh, but if we apply these things, they will, yeah, you will grow. Uh, I state those things both from personal experience and because of what the Word of God teaches us. Our, our primary verse or our theme verse for the three weeks will be Ephesians 6.10. It says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. To be strong in the Lord is to have a strong relationship with Him. There's no other reasonable conclusion to come from that verse. If you're familiar with the book of Ephesians, it's a great book, and the first half is focused on God's part of the relationship. Chapters 1, 2, and 3 are the things primarily that God has done, His side of your salvation, His side of the relationship. Chapters 4, 5, and 6 are much more about how we're supposed to act in this relationship, how we're supposed to respond to what he has done. And so it's a nice book in the way that it's kind of divided up there and that you see God's side and then here's man's side. And as he's closing the book, he's reminding us, he's encouraging the body, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Now, there are, of course, some things uh, that he is taking for granted here, and those are some of the things we're going to go over this morning. Uh, and one is, of course, that this people he's writing to, he's writing to the church in Ephesus, already have a relationship with God. They're already born again. They're living. They're not dead. And that's a, an important thing for us to understand, that you can't grow stronger in a relationship that you do not have. And so don't, uh, I, I, and this is an important step, and this is why I don't want to jump over this step. You know, there are some men in history that have been very religious. Uh, we could use the word pious. Uh, they were very dedicated men. Some of the men uh, that I, I've uh, been reading with my kids lately are, are George Whitfield and John Wesley. And you will know something? These were incredibly dedicated men in the scriptures for years, living more disciplined lives than probably anybody in this room, and they weren't saved yet. They didn't understand this relationship. And even in the midst, as they studied the scripture, you can actually read from uh, George Whitfield and his testimony. Uh, even, I believe he was about 20 years old, he almost killed himself, not, not through suicide, but through anxiety and refusing to eat almost died over the weight of hell. How can I be good enough? How can I fulfill this? And it wasn't until they understood about this relationship and that salvation was entirely a gift. And when they understood these things, their lives changed. And if you're familiar with them in history, you know that they both became very, very influential men throughout uh, uh, their time and into our time as well. But at the beginning there, as they were very religious men, they had no idea that God wanted a personal relationship with them. And so as we hear some of those things, and as you've heard those things for before, don't take it for granted, because a lot of history did not understand that. A lot of people still that are self-proclaimed Christians do not understand that. You know, I used to do street witnessing when I was younger, and, and it would stub, stumble me a little bit in, in trying to talk with people when you would knock on the door and somebody would say, you know, I'm already, oh, I'm already a Christian, we're Catholic. And I'd go, what do you say to Catholics, right, when you talk to them? You're like, you know, there's a lot of differences in, in Christianity and Catholicism, 
but they do have the right Jesus, right? They have the right Godhead, but then they bring in these other things. Um, some of them very big doctrinal problems, uh, very big disagreements with the Catholic Church. But going, how do you approach them? And, uh, and so I began to ask them when I'd knock, if they said they're Catholic, I'd say, how's your relationship with the Lord? And you, whenever you ask somebody that question, how's your relationship with the Lord, uh, you'll usually get one of three responses. I don't know if I've ever gotten anything else, but essentially one of these three responses. It's really good. Thank you. I'm struggling. It's hurting. We're distant at the moment. Or what do you mean? And that's why I asked that question, because if you have a relationship, you'd know where it's at. But if you didn't have a relationship, you also wouldn't understand the question. If you didn't know that what God wanted with you was a personal relationship, then you wouldn't understand the question. So we're going to go through John 3 uh, as Nicodemus comes to Jesus. Uh, And we're going to go through here uh, pretty quickly. Uh, We're not going to spend the whole morning here in John 3. But on how do we become born again? How do we become spiritually alive? How do we get into this relationship? So beginning in verse 1, it says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, A very influential person in his time, a very smart person. Uh, Theologically, he would have been probably somebody any of us would have loved to listen to teaching through the Old Testament. Very educated in in the scriptures in his time. And he says, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. You know, Nicodemus here, he uh, understands enough to recognize clearly God is with you. So Jesus answered him, it says in verse 3, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? All right. Uh, Jesus, as he's talking to him here, He says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He goes straight to the main point, the main need of Nicodemus. Nicodemus knows scripture. He knows the Bible, but Jesus knows Nicodemus, and he knows what he's missing. And what he's missing is this relationship. What he's missing is that he's not born again. And Jesus gives this statement. He says, "Uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It's also important to remember where we're going is a kingdom, and the ruler of that kingdom is God, and everyone that gets to go there are his subjects, people who have citizenship in his kingdom. And why am I bringing that up? Because it's also important for us to remember the God that we follow is a king, and he's over us. We are under him in this relationship. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? This isn't really a a serious question that he's asking Jesus. If you're familiar with Jewish hermeneutics, he is throwing out the most literal interpretation to rule it out. He's basically saying to Jesus, well, obviously you don't mean this, so what are you talking about? That's really what he's doing. And it's a great thing, actually, that for us that is there, because it's a reminder for us when we're reading through the scriptures, how did they look at it? Well, they were looking at it literally. He's taking what Jesus said, and he's going, well, if the literal doesn't fit, then you must be talking about something else. Obviously, you're not talking about physical birth here. What are you talking about? So verse 5, Jesus answered, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Jesus is making things very clear. You are born physically. You need to be born again 
spiritually. Ephesians chapter 2, we went through this a little while ago, just a few weeks ago at Christmas. But Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And you he made alive, being Jesus made us alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins. You see, we're born, when we're born, we're born physically alive. But we're also born with a sin nature, so we're born spiritually dead. And so we need to be born again. Jesus goes on in verse 8, says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. You know, we can't see the wind. We can feel it. You felt it this morning getting into your cars or coming into the church. You felt the wind blowing. You couldn't see it with your eyes. The same is true when you're born again. You can feel the transformation. You can tell that it's happened, but there isn't a visual on the outside. Outside, you look the same, but you know that you've been born again. In verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. All right, so Nicodemus, as he's hearing these things from Jesus, these are a first time for him. Again, he's spent years, probably decades at this point, studying the scriptures, but he has missed the primary purpose. What's the primary purpose? God created man, and he put him in the garden, and we get some insights as he put him in the garden. Uh, He goes walking in the garden. God goes walking in the garden to fellowship with Adam, to be with Adam. God created humanity to have a loving relationship with him. How else do we know that? Because that is what's restored through the cross. One day, those who place their faith in Christ, all of us who have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, will live with him forever. We will see him face to face. That which was lost in the garden is restored. And so we see that, and Nicodemus is missing, that it's not a book of rules. It's not just about a religious order. It's about a God that desires a personal relationship with his creation. And that's what Jesus here is explaining to him. And as he explains to him, he also is giving him a rebuke. If you're the teacher of Israel, you don't understand this, right? This is, this is uh, uh, theology 101. Right? It's like if you had a pastor that's never heard of Jesus dying on the cross and raising again for the sins. That's what Jesus is essentially rebuking him for. You've been studying the Bible your whole life and you missed the fact that you need to be saved uh, by faith. You missed that. And, and, and so he's giving him a rebuke. Then he also, in a sense, lays out his credentials. Uh, and he tells him, I'm from above. I'm from heaven, Nicodemus. Why is he doing this? This is not one rabbi talking to another rabbi. This isn't like, you know, you have a Methodist and a Presbyterian, and you have some differing views, and maybe you both just think different. He's letting him know, listen, Nicodemus, I'm from heaven, and you're not. So this is an education. This is a teaching session, not a theological debate. That's what Jesus is letting him know. I am telling you facts, simple facts, that you should understand. And so he's very gracious, I'd still say, in his rebuke, but he is also letting Nicodemus know this is not up to debate, and this is not my opinion. This is fact. Then he gets into verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him 
might be saved. So Jesus, as he is here preaching to Nicodemus, he goes back to the book of Numbers. Not surprising, he's talking with a Jewish rabbi. This is no doubt a topic that Nicodemus had taught before. Now remember, they didn't have chapters and uh, verses inserted in their Bibles back at this time, but he would have been familiar enough with the text. He would have known exactly where Jesus was talking about. Not only would have Nicodemus accepted the entire Old Testament as Scripture, but if you're familiar with Judaism, the emphasis is on the first five books. Right? And, and, and so Numbers would have been a book he was very, very familiar with. Most Jews still to this day, when you go to synagogues or different things, every year they teach through the first five books. That's their text that they typically repeat every year. Uh, and so he had taught, I am sure, already on this passage in Numbers. What is this passage that Jesus brings? Let me, let me bring you guys up to speed if you're not familiar with the bronze serpent that was lifted up. Uh, so you have the children of Israel. We're getting there uh, in our time in Genesis, right? We have uh, Jacob, and Jacob is going to have uh, 12 sons. These 12 sons, as he already told to Abraham, they're going to end up in Egypt. When they're in Egypt, they're going to end up in slavery for about 400 years. After that time, God is going to deliver them. We know that God delivered them through Moses. He he raised up Moses. He sent him to Pharaoh. Let my people go. We remember the 10 plagues God poured out on Pharaoh's kingdom as Pharaoh's heart was hardened. But finally, Pharaoh lets the people go. After they are released, they are trapped, if you recall, by the sea. Uh, Before before they're trapped, it was the institution of Passover, the final plague. The angel of death would come and kill the firstborn even the firstborn of Pharaoh's son, anyone who was not covered by the blood of the lamb. They took the blood of the lamb, they put it over the doorpost of their house and on the sides of the doors, and whoever was there, whoever was in that house, that death passed over. It's a picture for us of Christ, the lamb of God, that those who are covered by the blood, death passes over. And so then uh, they're, they're finally let go. Pharaoh tells them, leave, get out, and they plunder the people. Uh, they ask for jewelry and everything, and everybody gives them everything, and they just don't just leave, just leave. And, and so they go, and then they end up trapped by the sea. And Pharaoh is regretting that he let them go, so he goes to pursue them, to try to re-enslave them. But God parts the sea. The Israelites walk through. Pharaoh's armies pursue him in, and the sea closes around them and, and drowns them. After this point, there is a pillar of uh, fire at night and a cloud by day that leads the children of Israel from that time until they get to the promised land. What do these things mean for us? They're they're all a picture that God's painting. We as uh, believers have also been delivered from that which formerly enslaved us. And it was washed away, just like Pharaoh's army, just like it's a symbol almost of baptism. After that point, after we've been delivered... Uh, from that which enslaved us, we are led by the Spirit of God, just like they were led by a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day. So now we are led by the Spirit of God. Now in this time, God begins to uh, give these people direction and to bring them to the promised land. But as they get there, they send in 12 spies and they come back with this report that there's giants in the land and and the people become afraid and they don't want to go in. So God says, you know what? You all walk around in the wilderness for 40 years, and when you die, I'll give it to your kids. And that's what he does. But during this 40 years, he also miraculously feeds them. He gives them manna and quail to eat every day and water from the rock. And so he supplies for their needs, and their shoes don't wear out, and their clothes don't wear out for 40 years. These miracle provisions. So as we get now to Numbers 21, where Jesus is preaching to Nicodemus. We're at the end, almost, of this 40-year wilderness journey. And we're going to pick up uh, in in Numbers 21, verse 4. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? 
For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was if the serpent had bitten anyone when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So the people are in this discouraged state. They're in this down state, and they begin to speak out against God and against Moses. Now, Moses is a type of Christ in the sense that he's a, a picture. Uh, Moses said that God will raise up for you a prophet like me, and that was Jesus Christ, a mediator between God and man. You see here, who goes to, the, to God for the people? Moses does. Who, who, who goes before the Father on our behalf? Jesus does. Right, and so Moses carries this symbolism. And so these people, they're despising God and his mediator. And they are un uh, discontent with God's provision in this journey. They are unthankful for the food and the water that has been provided. They are unthankful for their deliverance out of slavery. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. You know, as we read this passage, I think, uh, I often wonder, how did they deal with this before Jesus taught on it on John 3? It's a really weird passage. You know, you're like, they're not supposed to make anything that could be resembling of an idol. Here they're told to make a bronze serpent. It seems like a weird command. Why did he do it that way? It's very strange. Uh, why did he send in fiery serpents? The people complained through this journey all the time. Even when he first gave them manna, the people are complaining like this. They didn't get fiery serpents. They got manna that time. Why did they get fiery serpents this time? Well, if you understand some of the symbolism in the text, and I'll explain some of it to you, and we'll dive into it more in the coming weeks so it makes sense because you shouldn't just take my word for it. But there is this picture that is being painted for us. And as they're being brought out of Egypt in the wilderness, they're complaining there's no food. That's a lie. They're complaining there's no water. That's a lie. And, and then lastly, they're saying, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. or detest. It's like almost like a, uh, like a curse word that is inserted there for how they feel about the manna. They're over it. Okay? They're unappreciative of it. So we obviously can see their complaining hearts because they first they complain there is no food. And then the real complaint is, actually, the problem is we hate the food. We're over the food. We want to eat something else. That's really the complaint. What's the problem with these things? Well, remember, they're speaking against God. They're speaking against the mediator. And what does the manna represent? The manna represents the word of God. What does the, spirit rep or the, the uh, water represent? The water represents the spirit of God. And so you have this picture of these people, and they're despising God and his mediator, and they're despising the word and the spirit, and they're saying, we want something else. So fiery serpents come in. Why fiery serpents is another interesting term. You could translate it poisonous serpents, but I think fiery serpents is actually the better translation. But I've never personally seen a fiery serpent. So why the term? Well, obviously, it's given us this picture of these sins that lead to death, that lead to hell. This warning for us that the despising of these things is a dangerous sin. This sin of discontentment and complaining against God for his provisions is a dangerous sin. I think that's the warning that he's given. So as the people are bitten, they're infected by this sin. This is another thing for us to grab out of here. There is nothing now they can do. Those that have been bitten by this serpent, there is nothing they can do of themselves to cure it. What do they do? Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. They repent. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. 
they recognize we have offended God and we have spoken against the mediator. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. That's the the backdrop we're getting here. So what do we do when we find ourselves in sin, when we find ourselves in things that lead to death? We repent, and we go to Jesus. Lord, forgive me. Help me, Lord. Make this right. Intercede on my behalf. In verse 8, then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten when he looks at it shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Now, as we're going through this, I also want to remind you, this passage that Jesus is drawing the gospel out of, for a Jew, this was beautiful. They look for these pictures. Actually, rabbis love these pictures. They still love them. Some of them call them motifs. Some of them call them midrashes. Some of them call them uh, just pictures. There's different names for them. They're considered a deeper understanding of theology. The Bible has plain teaching that is always there that teaches a theology. These pictures never create a theology. They only explain one. But when Jesus is explaining this theology to them, through the picture for him to understand it. And so this would have really spoken to Nicodemus. This would have really grabbed him with what Jesus was saying. But he, uh, the Lord said to him to make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And so he makes this bronze serpent. And so why does the picture that is being given for us? Uh, there is uh, this bronze serpent that is put up on a pole. Bronze is a judgment metal. And so it's a picture that the Son of God would be lifted up on a pole And the judgment of God would be poured out on him for the sins of the world, for the sins of the people. And that whoever looks to it would be saved. It's an incredible picture. And that's what Jesus is teaching Nicodemus. That the bronze serpent on the pole, that's a prophetic picture of him. And here's something you find that's phenomenal. This is one of my greatest confidences in the Bible. Is not only do we know it's historically accurate. This really happened. The people of Israel were really in Egypt. We can look through this stuff through archaeology and everything. They were in Egypt. They were delivered. They went to the land that God said that the Bible says. It's all correct. But not only does God do this, but through real life events, he paints prophetic picture after picture after picture. And to me, that blows my mind. That he is working with these fallen, rebellious people And he paints prophecy through these different events. And he teaches these things. This is about 1,400 years before Jesus comes. And look at this beautiful picture that is already there. What an incredible testimony to the word of God. So let's go back over to John. Back to John chapter 3. Now that we understand the picture. Picking back up in verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Jesus again here prophesying of his his crucifixion that would come. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is how one becomes born again. This is how one enters into a relationship with God. By faith, by looking unto Jesus Christ for the healing of the sin, for the removal of the sin, the recognition, I have a sin that leads to death. Obviously, our spiritual condition is not just dealing with, our, with at all with our physical death. It's dealing with our spiritual death. It's dealing with an eternal separation from God and hell. That's what Jesus came and healed us from. And he didn't just save us from that. There was a fracture that happened in man's fellowship with God, man's relationship with God. And Jesus restores that. Jesus puts us back in good standing with the Father, where now we can be his children. Now we can be a part of his family because we are clean. There is nothing separating us from him. And so when we 
place our faith in Christ, when we look to Jesus and we cry out, Lord, save me, then we become born again and we enter this relationship. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. You cannot earn your salvation. You cannot be good enough. We strive to be followers of Christ because we're in this relationship. And because we're in this relationship, we should want to be like our Father. We should want to love God more than anyone. We see that his motive to come down was love. And what we're supposed to give him back is love. He said, I want to be in this relationship with you. Do you want to be in this relationship with me? And we're supposed to say, yes, Lord. Yes, I do. But we can't earn it. Don't ever think for a moment, well, I need to be good enough for Jesus. We should strive to love him, but you're only ever going to be good enough by looking to Jesus to be cleansed from your sin. That is the only way. There is no other way. Jesus also warns us right here in John, actually, of the two things that keep people from following him. Starting in verse 18, he says, he who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they have been done in God. Two things that keep people from following God, lack of faith and love of sin. Everything falls back to those two categories, lack of faith and love of sin. That's what keeps people from following him. So guard your heart against those things. It's also important to remember uh, darkness that wants to remain in darkness does not like the light, does not appreciate it. Everyone practicing evil hates the light. The message of the cross is, uh, is uh, confronting the sin nature of humanity. You need to be saved. That's an offensive message to somebody who doesn't want to repent. But let it offend them. It's the only way to have everlasting life. I also want to just touch quickly on this only begotten. That term is often really really uh, hard for people to understand the way it comes across in the English. What does that mean, Jesus is the only begotten Son? It means He is the only one that comes from the Father. We are all created by the Father. Jesus comes from Him, from His essence. He is God. And so we don't come from God. We are created by God. Jesus comes from God. That is the difference in Jesus and the rest of humanity. But before we can grow, as our verse states, then we must be born again. We have to be spiritually alive before we can grow stronger. It seems like a simple concept, but you'd be shocked at the amount of people who try to grow but aren't yet alive. And it's a simple concept, and to be in a relationship with God, we also have to be born again. We understand these things very well because of the physical pictures in our world, too. We obviously know that somebody who has physically died can't grow stronger anymore. It's impossible. doesn't matter if we bury him at the gym. They're still going to de- de- decompose just the same. Right? It doesn't change anything. To grow stronger, you have to be alive. And the same is true with a relationship. You can't grow stronger or closer or a, a clo- a, in a more intimate relationship that doesn't exist. The relationship must precede the growing in it. The being born again has to come first. And they happen at the same time. When you become born again, you enter into a relationship with God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14 say, In him, being Jesus, in Jesus you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. 
The guarantee of your salvation is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And that's manifested or that's made known, that's revealed to us through a relationship that you know God. You know, I think everybody at some point in time has asked the question, you know, how do I know that I'm saved? Well, there's a guarantee. It's given right here in Ephesians 1. The guarantee of our inheritance is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Do you know him? That's the guarantee. It's kind of like the question, like if you're looking right now, if you're you're married, how do you know that you're married? Well, hopefully your spouse is there next to you or you know where they're at. You have a relationship there. You live together. You do life together. Right? If you're, uh, if you have parents, and uh, you obviously you know them, and so we see these examples of these relationships, and the same is true with the Holy Spirit. And so the fact that there's a relationship between you and God, that is the guarantee of your salvation. That's where you should take your greatest comfort that I belong to Him is because I know Him. Not I know about Him like Nicodemus did. But I know him personally. What are some examples of ways you can know him? Uh, evidence of, of those things. Well, one, John 10 says, my sheep know my voice. Has God ever spoken to you? Whether that's been through the times you've been in his word, correction when you're in sin, encouragement when you were down. Has the Lord ever ministered to you? Have you ever felt his presence? Have you ever been with the Lord? I hope you have. Because those are... Those are evidences of your salvation. What about correction? God says he disciplines. He corrects every son in whom he delights. Has the Lord ever taught you anything? Has he ever corrected you? Has he ever called you out of something? Those are good things. Because that means there's a relationship there. Yeah, you know, sometimes we don't like conviction. If the Lord's convicting us over sin, we usually get discouraged. I encourage you, don't be discouraged. Thank you, Lord, because that's evidence of a relationship. That's part of the guarantee. When the Lord's calling you out of something, thank you, Lord. God's speaking to me. Life's good. We should listen. We should listen. We should receive what he says to us, but we should be looking for those things. Some people have mistaken this passage to mean that the evidence uh, of the indwelling of the Spirit is speaking in tongues. It's been a misunderstanding of this passage, misunderstanding of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that it's uh, revealed through the speaking of tongues. The, the gift that is given is revealed in a relationship. It's if you know him. That's what is the guarantee. Now, there's some other references that make that clear for us. First John chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, it says, And this is my commandment, that we should believe on the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave his commandment. Now, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. 1 John chapter 4, verses 15 and 16. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that the love of God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. There is this abiding within each other. And that is where we see the Spirit of God manifested in that relationship that we have with him. Matthew chapter 7 gives us the warning of the other. Matthew 7 verse 21 and 23. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Did you catch that? What did he say to him? I never knew you. That's the key. That's the guarantee. And that's what God has called us all into. He didn't just call us uh, to be saved into this detached religious system. He's called us into a personal relationship with him. What an incredible God that he wants this relationship with us. Now, there's a few other things we need to understand about this relationship. In this relationship, there are roles. There's roles in this relationship. 
Okay, uh, Ephesians 5, it talks about marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Now, because we often misunderstand the roles of men and women, we can often not understand that picture. But that means that Christ is the head and we are in the position of submitting. He's the head of the house. Uh, we are the bride. We are the submissive one in that role. Romans 8 uh, gives the example of God being the father and we are the kids. Again, who's in charge in a parent-kid relationship? The parents are in charge or should be in charge. If you're not in charge in your house, you should be in charge. Uh, kids should not be running the home, though we see that more than we uh, would like, uh, for sure, in our society where, where people are not leading their kids. But God is a good father, so God being a good father leads his kids. And in that role, the children are in a role of submission. Dad gets to pick. Now, we, don't, we know also from the roles, even we see in marriage, God is not a, a, a harsh leader. He's not a forceful leader. We even actually see that within the roles of marriage. The wife is called to a role of submission, but it's also always supposed to be a willful submission. It's not supposed to be a demanded or, or a, uh, uh, this idea of like what we see in Islam of a, of a power grabbing from guys forcing the women into submission. That's not the picture. It's supposed to be a willful submission. It talks about that. And we are supposed to willfully submit ourselves to Christ, to joyfully submit ourselves to Christ. We also talked earlier about that there is a kingdom, and the king of the kingdom is Jesus, is God. We are the subjects. We should understand that in a society that, that the king is higher than the citizens. And so we should have this respect. We should understand he's in charge we're not. He gets to make the rules we follow. Thank you, Lord. He is a great king. Thank you, Lord. He is a great father. Thank you, Lord. He is a great husband. He's perfect in all his ways. So thank you that we can trust confidently in his leading. But those are also his rightful positions. And each of those positions, do you see where the church is? The church, the believer, is always in the position of submission. God's leading, the church is following. We see those things come in other ways as well. You know, it's the father's responsibility to provide for the kids. Aren't you glad that God's provided for you for eternity? You don't got to figure that out? Thank you, Lord. It's the husband's job to protect the bride, right? Aren't you thankful for what Christ has done for you? Amen. I'm thankful he leads. You know, I find his pictures just fit perfect because, you know, I like to lead in my home, but between me and the Lord, I am so thankful I get to follow. <laughs> I'm so thankful he's leading and it's not all on me. I am thankful for that role. I go, Lord, I thank you. I'm glad you got that role, and I would way rather be following you than having to try to figure this out. So thank you. And we should embrace that role. Often, I think we see in our society that if people don't like what God says, they just try to bounce to another church that doesn't say it. <laughs> we should be subjecting ourselves joyfully and willfully to the Word of God, not looking for ways around it, but seeking, Lord, what is your will and how can I best walk in it? Because you gave everything for your love for me, and I want to love you back. I want to be the best son I can be. I want to be the best bride I can be. I want to be the best citizen in your kingdom I can be. I want to love you the best. And actually what we find what God wants in this relationship is exactly what we want in a relationship. He wants us to love him back. That's Matthew chapter 22. Jesus is being asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he replies, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment commandment. This was a, a Jewish lawyer, meaning again an expert in, in the Old Testament law, asking Jesus this. And there was actually a few different schools of thought at the time, and this answer wasn't either of them. And so I think this guy was trying to trap Jesus into a, into a corner to try to get to argue one doctrinal point against the other. But Jesus answers perfectly. 
What's the most important commandment? Now, listen to the power of what Jesus is saying. If you understand one commandment in the entire Bible, understand this one commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Listen, God brought us into this relationship for God so loved the world. And what does he want back? He wants us to love him back. This makes perfect sense because anybody here that's married, you know, you probably got married to the person you are with because you love them. And what is the main thing you want back for them? To love you back. That's what you want. You love your kids, right? But what do you want back from your kids? Love. You want a relationship with them. What's par- what, what, what is parents' nightmare? Is that their kids grow up and shun them. They don't want anything to do with them. That, that's heartbreaking. It's painful. It's hard. You know what? We learn a lot of things from these relationships, and it's not a surprise that God gave us these things to teach us about the relationship he wants with us. He wants to be first in each of our lives because we love him the most. As we're talking about loving him, it's also important that we love him his way. You remember Cain and Abel? One offered a sacrifice that was acceptable, the other one didn't. John 14, 21, it says, He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I'll love him and manifest myself or make myself known to him. When we're looking to love God, we need to love God the way that God wants to be loved, the way that he describes love. What are some ways that are not loving to God? You know, if you ignore God, uh, in different ways, uh, that's not, not loving. I'll give you one example that's a very easy one. You know, God obviously wants us to, uh, uh, to share our faith, right? If you're single here this morning, uh, he doesn't want you to do it through missionary dating, right? And people will justify things like this all the time. Why are you doing that? Well, because it's giving me a chance to share, share my faith over in this setting. You're like, yeah, but God said you should be unequally yoked. Yeah, yeah, but I'm, I'm witnessing to this person. And so I'm, I'm actually, I'm loving God by, by dating her. No, you're deceiving yourself. You should be loving God first. You need to love him your, his way, not your way. You need to do it the ways that he said. So the things that he loves, those are the things you should love and do. And the things he hates, those are the things you should hate and avoid and trust him. Ultimately, what does God want from us in a relationship? It's, it's actually quite simple when you break it down. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to submit and follow him because we love him and trust him. He wants us to have confidence in him. He wants us to delight in him. He wants us to serve him because we love him. And he wants us to want to spend time with him. Basically, he wants what you want out of a relationship. That's what he wants. If you have not entered this relationship with God yet this morning, I invite you. Come and see that God is good. This is the best relationship I've ever entered into in my entire life. I wouldn't trade Jesus for anything. And if you haven't come to know him as your Lord and Savior, I invite you. As we read, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Because if that's you this morning, if you haven't entered that relation, repent. Turn to the Lord. Say, Lord, I believe. Look unto Jesus Christ and say, Lord, save me. And enter into the joy of the Lord. Enter into that relationship. But for us who do have a relationship with him, what is my encouragement to you? Wake up and actually ask that question of how do I love him today? You know, when you're dating and and you're uh, in a newer relationship, uh, you're thinking, how can I let the person know they're special? How can, and, and then after you've been married for a while, you, you're, you're reminded like, hey, we still need to make sure we're doing that, that we're investing in our relationship, that we're expressing love and appreciation and spending time to, together alone. And you make those things a priority. You make them important, or at least you do if you want to have a healthy relationship. But why? Not because you have to. Not because it's what good married people do. You should do it because you love your spouse, because you want a strong relationship with them. So I want to encourage you to be motivated by love for God. 
And uh, why do you read the Bible? Why do you resist sin? Why do you pray? It shouldn't be just because that's what good Christians do. It should be because we love God. That's why. You know, when you do things because you love God, you know, even within ministry, if you're serving because you love God, you know, nobody can rob your blessing. That was one of the most fruitful things I ever learned. If you go out and you please God, it doesn't matter if nothing else happened with it. It's like why people like Jeremiah still had powerful ministries. Men that all heard it weren't pleased, but God was pleased. And that's who we should be worried about leaving. So so my challenge to you for this year is to wake up each day and ask the question, how can I love God today? And then to act upon it and do it. Be intentional, saying, Lord, I thank you so much for your love towards me. And I want to walk in this relationship that you've blessed me with that will last forever. And so how can I express love to you today? I want you to think about it, and I want you to do it, because the first and greatest commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you so much for our time together this morning. I thank you, Lord, for your love for us. I thank you, Lord, for bringing us into this relationship with you. I thank you that you are a personal God. Lord, I pray that each of us would walk in this relationship. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercy, Lord, that overcomes all our shortcomings. Lord, we're so unworthy to get to walk with you, but you have made us clean. You have redeemed us. You have washed away our sin. So now we can come boldly before your throne, Lord. Now we can walk filled with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that our heart's aims would be to love you. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't pursue just religion or just trying to be good people, but that we would delight and that we are loved by you and that we would love you back, that we would glorify you, that we would worship you, that we would honor you. Lord, you are worthy of all of our love, all of our affection. Lord, I pray that you would teach each of us to love you the way that you love us. Grow us in you, Lord. I pray that we would love the things you love and hate the things you hate. Lord, I pray that we would joyfully and willfully follow your leading, trusting 100% in you. I pray that you would strengthen this body in this next year, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would build each of us up in you. Grow us in you. Lord, I thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. From creation to the cross There from the cross into eternity Your grace finds me Yes, your grace